Today's webinar is being presented by Claire Shetty, our staff psychologist at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. She graduated with honors from the University of Florida with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and a minor in General Education. She completed graduate training at Florida Institute of Technology, completing a doctoral degree in clinical psychology and a master's degree in applied behavioral analysis. Dr. Shetty has treated a diverse population of children, adolescents, and adults in a variety of clinical settings, including community clinics, college counseling centers, psychiatric hospitals, private practice, and private treatment programs. She has extensive experience in the area of child and adult psychological evaluation and assessment, and recently completed a postdoctoral residency in psychological evaluation. Her graduate training led Dr. Shetty to discover an interest in helping individuals with autism and developmental disorders. She has provided individual therapy, group therapy, and social skills training to individuals on the autism spectrum and is excited to continue helping those with autism and related disorders by providing psychological evaluations at the Johnson Center. Before we begin the presentation, please note that questions can be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation, and time permitting, they will be addressed at the end. I also wanted to mention for those that are wondering, uh, we cannot send out copies of the presentation per se, but following the presentation, we will post the recording on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. Um, so please, if you're interested in replaying any of this information, um, you're welcome to access any of our free webinars throughout uh, that have been presented throughout this year on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. Now, please welcome Dr. Shitty. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm Dr. Claire Shitty, as Nisi said, and I'm our psychologist here at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. And I'm excited to talk with you today on an important topic. Um, the title of my presentation is Sexuality and Autism, How to Address Sex Education um, for Learners with Autism Spectrum Disorders. Just to give a brief overview of the different topics I'm going to be covering today, I'm going to start off by defining some related terminology. I'm then going to discuss some stigmas and taboo that are commonly related um, to sex education. I'm going to give a brief overview on what research shows in terms of sexuality and sex education for individuals on the autism spectrum. I'm going to talk about the importance of sex education for individuals with autism autism spectrum disorders, as well as special issues um, that learners face in terms of sexuality um, and sex education, as well as some guidelines and goals for teaching this topic. Um, and most of what we talked about today can be applied both to parents and professionals who are wanting to provide education either to their, their children or individuals that they work with who have autism spectrum disorders. So my hope is that um, you'll end this presentation with a comprehensive overview of some tips and strategies to use, important topics, um, as well as kind of where to go from here in um, planning for educating um, learners on sexuality and sex education who have autism spectrum disorders. So to start off with some definitions, the definitions that I'm going to be sharing I got from the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization, they define sexuality as an integral part of the personality of every man, woman, and child. Sexuality is a basic need and an aspect of being human that cannot be separated from other aspects of human life. Sexuality isn't the same as sexual intercourse, and it influences our thoughts, feelings, actions, and interactions, and therefore our mental and physical health. 
what I like about this definition is that um, it states that sexuality is part of what makes us human because it is um, and it's a basic need. I also like how this um, definition points out that sexuality influences a lot about what makes us human. It influences our thoughts, feelings, actions, um, and therefore our mental and physical health. Um, this definition is, is older. I just liked this one by the World Health Organization because it is a bit more simpler than some of their more updated definitions. They define sexual health as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. It requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences, free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. What I like about this definition is that it highlights that sexual health is related to our physical, mental, and social well-being, as well as related to having safe sexual experiences, um, especially just highlighting the safety aspect of sexual health, which is very important. The topic of sexuality and sex education, um, a lot of times it creates a level of discomfort um, for many individuals, um, and it's a topic that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. A lot of the reason for this is that there's a lot of stigma and taboos related to sexuality. Um, what these stigmas and taboos create are barriers, both for us in educating individuals as well as barriers for the learners that need this information. So it's important to overlook um, stigmas and taboos and to see this topic as a serious topic um, that needs to be accessible particularly to learners with autism spectrum disorders. Sexuality is sometimes, sometimes viewed as a controversial topic it's very important as educators, whether you're a parent or a professional, um, to be able to have a serious, open, and honest conversation um, about sexuality. Um, however, this can be difficult for many people. Um, and a lot of times there's different personal, social, and, and for example, cultural issues that can influence our comfort level with this topic. Sexuality can really be viewed as a form of behavior. Um, sexuality is a behavior that's part of our human development, and it's related to both our social and adaptive behavior. When I say adaptive behavior, what I mean is age-appropriate behaviors that are necessary for independent living. Adaptive behavior is also necessary to function safely in daily life. And adaptive behaviors involve life skills such as hygiene, dressing, um, ability to work, following school rules, money management, social skills, as well as personal responsibility. And sexual health and sexuality fit into adaptive behaviors. So when we're thinking about, um, you know, the taboos and stigmas that are associated with sexuality, it's important to view sexuality as a basic part of what makes us human, as well as viewing sexuality as behavior and really a form of adaptive behavior. Sexuality isn't all about sex. Um, the main focus on sexuality and sex education um, should really be on understanding your body as well as um, sexual health and safety. So if you think about it, a lot of things that we associate with sexuality have to do with one of these two topics, understanding your body as well as um, safety and self-protection. So a quick overview on what research we have regarding this topic in individuals with autism spectrum disorders. 
What we do have in terms of research is research on um, individual interests, understanding, and behavior related to sexuality. So we have research showing that individuals with autism spectrum disorders are interested in intimate sexual relationships. Their understanding of sexuality and related topics can be limited. Um, and we also have research showing that there's a risk for inappropriate sexual behavior um, for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. What we don't have in terms of research are studies on actual sexuality and sex education intervention for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. This is a very lacking area um, in the literature and we don't have much um, supporting literature for what types of curriculum and what works in terms of um, se sex education. So it's a very high need area and we need more resources and more research on what interventions work for teaching this topic. So when we're combining this under-researched area plus some of those stigmas and taboos and discomfort related to the topic, on top of that, a very high need area and high need population, um, all of our learners with autism spectrum disorders need to learn these safety skills and understand what is happening in their, with their body. Um, so when we're combining these factors, we're creating some potential for problems. Um, so there really needs to be um, more resources, more education, and more support for how to um, teach sexuality education for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. Um, luckily, we're moving in the direction of having more resources available. Um, a lot of the information that I did obtain for today's presentation um, comes from Peter Gerhardt. He's a, a specialist on this area and works at the McCartan School, um, and he's a great resource for this topic. So why is uh, sex education and sexuality important um, for individuals with autism spectrum disorders? Well, just like everyone else, individuals with autism have the same hormones, the same physical responses, feelings, and desires as everyone else. Safety is very important. Um, individuals with autism spectrum disorders um, are at a higher risk of being coerced to do things that they might not understand or want to do, and there is a risk of um, abuse and, and we need to help teach self-protection skills as part of this topic. There's also the potential for gaining inaccurate or harmful information. Um, because of the communication, social, and thinking differences that individuals on the, on the spectrum have, they're at a higher risk for misunderstanding information regarding sexuality. We also have um, information resources such as the internet, which are a huge area of risk for learners obtaining inaccurate or harmful information regarding sexuality. So it's important that they're receiving the correct information and that it's presented in a way that they can understand and learn from. And most importantly, um, learners on the autism spectrum have the right to learn and have access to information to become sexually healthy individuals. So I'd like to review just some special issues and challenges that learners with autism spectrum disorders have in relation to um, understanding sexuality. Um, Individuals with autism, they have differences and challenges in the areas of social understanding, communication, and their thinking and perception. All of these factors can make um, understanding sexuality a bit more difficult. Um, so for example, difficulties with communication um, can make it harder for the individual to know what questions to ask and how to ask the questions as well as understanding what is said. Um, differences or challenges with thinking and perception such as very black and white thinking or literal thinking um, 
these ways of thinking and perceiving information can really impact how well the learner is understanding what we're teaching in terms of sexuality. A lot of times there can be a lot of difficulty in terms of understanding their own bodies and feelings. Um, as I mentioned before, they can be easily coerced um, or they might do things to gain acceptance from peers, so they're at a higher risk um, to do this. And a lot of times teens get a lot of information about sexuality from their peers. However, um, for teens with autism spectrum disorders, this isn't always an available option. And if they are getting information from their peers, there's the potential for misunderstanding and misperception of the information that they're getting. Another challenge is that many schools don't offer sex education. And again, there is some limited information out there on how to provide sex education to learners with autism spectrum disorders. There's a lot of myths out there regarding sexuality and in individuals with autism spectrum disorders, um, such as individuals with autism are, asex are asexual or hypersexual, they might have little interest in sexual behavior, or they're all heterosexual. Um, all of these statements are actually false. These are all false myths that some people might have. Um, and it's important to debunk these myths and to see past these myths. And really the sexuality of individuals with autism spectrum disorders has been shown to parallel that of the neurotypical population. Um, so it's really important when we're viewing this topic um, to be sensitive to sexual diversity. So some things to consider um, when you are going to be educating an individual um, with autism on sexuality and sex ed. Um, you definitely want to consider the individual's developmental or cognitive level, um, as well as their level of social, behavioral, and emotional maturity. There can be a high level of variability across individuals on the spectrum, so you want to make sure that your intervention and education is individualized to the learner's needs. Um, so you're taking into consideration their developmental level as well as their um, social knowledge, for example. You also want to consider the age of the learner. Um, sexuality education, it's really important for it to start early. So some of the early topics that should be covered regarding this are things like safety and gender discrimination. Um, so when I say gender discrimination, I'm referring to knowing the difference between male and female. So the education should start early and continue throughout the individual's development and be tailored to the individual. You also want to consider the level of support the learner has. So do they have therapists working with them? Um, is a teacher also providing education? Are the parents involved? Um, and you want to try to take a team approach to the education whenever possible. With this topic, you also want to consider personal differences. So these might be differences in the individual's interest in relationships, interest in intimate relationships, um, cultural differences, and family values. All of these things are important to consider um, within sex education. So who should teach this topic? Um, Parents are typically one of the big educators on this topic, um, and when possible, it's, it's helpful to have a partnership between parents and professionals, um, especially if you do have other professionals who are working with your child. <clears throat> um, oftentimes, schools provide the education, sometimes they don't, um, and as much as possible, um, the instructor who's teaching the material should match the learner. Um, for example, a male instructor should work with an adolescent male 
um, or a female with an adolescent female. So before we get into um, topics that should be covered, I'd like to talk about some tips on how to best present the information. It's really important as the educator not to make any assumptions on the part of the learner. So you don't want to assume that they already understand um, the difference between male and female or the difference between a public restroom and a private restroom. It's best to start with a clean slate. Um, it's also very important that when you're teaching this topic um, to learners with autism spectrum disorders to make things as clear and realistic as possible because they are at risk to misperceive or to have that literal style of thinking um, which creates a risk for them to misunderstand the information. So you want to make things explicit, clear, and to use very concrete and realistic examples. So included in this is you want to avoid any figurative speech and euphemisms, for example. Um, we often hear the term sleeping together as referred to as intercourse, um, but that, that term sleeping together could be confusing for a learner with autism. Um, they might think of sleeping together as laying next to um, someone in the bed and falling asleep, whereas intercourse is a, is a totally different thing. So it's important to not use um, confusing language like that. Or, or another example is the birds and the bees. This is a very common phrase we, hear, we, we refer to as um, talks about sex and puberty and things like that. Um, but that phrase, the birds and the bees, could be very confusing to a learner with autism. Another example of using realistic examples is a lot of times in sexual education, um, when they're demonstrating how to use a condom appropriately, it's demonstrated on a banana. Um, a lot of learners might be able to generalize learning and the modeling of putting a condom on a banana. However, individuals with autism are at risk to, um, you know, they might understand how to put it on a banana, but without having a more realistic example, when the time comes, they might not actually be able to do it appropriately. Um, so when teaching how to use a condom, it would be best to use a more realistic um, tangible model such as a medical model of a penis and how to put the condom on an actual penis and not a banana. Um, some other tips are to use discrimination training which is um, basically a teaching style that applied behavioral and um, excuse me applied behavioral analysts use um, to teach differences between different stimuli. Um, so in, examples of how you can use discrimination training would be to teach differences between males and females. Um, but again, you want to keep examples as um, specific and clear as possible. Um, a lot of times, for example, we're taught, you know, male and female based on pictures and the male might classically have short hair. However, it's important to teach discrimination of, well, some males have long hair, um, and to use multiple examples, multiple visuals of how to discriminate between male and female. Some more examples of some tips in terms of educating on this topic. You want to use as many multiple examples as you can to help the learner generalize what they're learning. Um, so if, for example, you're teaching bathroom etiquette, you want to review multiple examples for etiquette in different types of bathrooms. So it might be um, using a bathroom at someone else's home compared to using the bathroom at school, compared to using a bathroom that has um, urinals in it, bathrooms that don't. Um, so you're, if you're teaching bathroom etiquette, you're teaching it across many different um, examples of different types of bathrooms. It's also very important that um, 
what we're teaching might occur in a classroom environment, but you want to also probe to see whether or not it's translating to the individual's real life. Um, so they might demonstrate understanding of these topics in a classroom um, or in a teaching environment, but you should really check in to see are they understanding this at a later time um, and outside of just that teaching environment. You want to keep your presentation of the material. You want to be as serious and calm as you can. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's also helpful to break down all of the concepts and instructions into manageable chunks. So for example, using what they call an applied behavior analysis as task analysis, which basically means breaking down specific steps of an entire task so that it can be easier to learn and is more manageable to learn. Repetition and consistency is also important. Um, so not just teaching an important concept one time, um, but rehearsing it and reviewing it regularly. Visual aids are also very helpful, especially for learners with autism. Um, a lot of them are more visual learners, so it's important to pair the material that you're um, talking about or teaching with visual aids, such as diagrams or pictures. It's very important to be proactive on teaching the relevant topics. Um, too often, a lot of times topics such as safety or um, rules and laws are covered after something bad happens. Um, so for example, covering the topic of rules and laws after the individual engaged in inappropriate sexual, sexual behavior. It's really important that the education is proactive um, and comes before the individual might be faced with some of these issues. Another example is talking about puberty before it starts. Um, puberty can be very scary to any adolescent, um, so it's important for them to understand what to expect. So again, um, sexuality education should be proactive. In terms of materials, um, when you're teaching these topics, it's best to use very basic and simple materials. Again, um, using visual aids can be very helpful. The materials that you use, you want to try to make them tailored to the individual and what their learning needs are. Whenever possible, you want to keep the materials clear from distractions, so if you're using um, certain pictures to depict something. You want to make sure that there's not too much distracting um, pictures or other things going on in the background. You want to use, again, as many multiple examples as you, as you have to aid in generalization. Um, in terms of drawings, it's best for um, drawings and models to be as graphic and realistic as possible. Um, a lot of times with sex education or topics, there might be um, very cartoonish or even line drawings of humans. Um, even if they're cartoons, it's best if you can find material that's the most realistic as possible um, because learners on the spectrum are going to learn best when it's realistic and it's something that they can recognize and relate to. You want to be careful with different commercial products that are out there um, because most of them aren't made for individuals with autism. So if you are using different commercial products, try to follow these other guidelines here in terms of materials. Um, and if you need to, collect or make your own materials. For example, <clears throat> medical textbooks, nursing textbooks, um, anatomy and physiology textbooks, a lot of times they have more um, explicit and clear and realistic um, visuals and pictures that can be used. Now I'm going to walk us through an overview of some of the important topics that should be covered in a sex education program for individuals with autism. Um, 
unfortunately, I don't have enough time to get into details of how to teach um, every single topic within these more broad topics. So it's more of an overview of the broad topics that should be covered. Um, and again, these should be topics that both parents and professionals um, should be comfortable teaching learners with autism spectrum disorders. Um, and again, you want to make sure um, that you're individualizing to the individual learner based on those things we talked about, such as their cognitive level, um, their de developmental level, as well as their social and emotional maturity. So the first topic I'm going to talk about, um, I've kind of summarized it into anatomy and body changes. So some things that you want to cover within this topic are things like gender discrimination, knowing the difference between male and female. You also want to cover um, sexual organs and body parts. Um, this topic, while it might seem simple, it actually gets pretty confusing, especially for learners with autism, um, because there's so much multiple terminology and context that can be used. Um, for example, for sexual organs, a lot of times there's different formal terms, technical terms, versus um, kind of cutesy terms and slang terms that people use to refer to sexual organs. For example, um, the term vagina would be a formal term. A technical term might be um, a part such as labia versus a cutesy term. Um, the JJ is something we hear these days versus a slang term. Um, so our learners with autism might be hearing all of these different terms, um, which can become very confusing when you're teaching something basic like sexual organs. Um, you want to make sure that you're using developmentally appropriate language as well um, when you're talking about sexual organs and body parts. Um, such as referring to PP as a sexual organ or PP as going to the bathroom. Um, you know, try to use language that's at the level of the individual's age. Um, and whenever possible, use medical terms. These medical terms will be the most um, realistic terms that you can use when you're teaching things like sexual organs and body parts. So using the term um, penis and vagina, which are the medical terms um, for sexual organs. Within this topic, it's also important to cover pubertal changes in puberty. A few things to consider um, when teaching puberty are making sure to cover when to expect the changes. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's important for this information to be proactive. Um, so you want to make sure you educate before the learner hits puberty so that things aren't as scary and new and confusing once it does happen. Um, you also want to cover the physical changes that happen during puberty, such as breast growth, um, voice changes, pubic hair, as well as some of the possible behavioral challenges like masturbation, ejaculation, and wet dreams. Um, so these are just some of the topics that should be covered when going over puberty. Um, and then some other topics that could also be included in the broad topic of anatomy and body changes would be things like menstruation, intercourse, and pregnancy. So here's a quick example where I've kind of integrated some of the teaching tips into teaching um, the topic of menstruation. So thinking back to some of those teaching tips, I talked about things like rehearsal, um, using visuals, for example. So you want to make sure if you're teaching menstruation that you're presenting information um, in other ways than just verbally. So you want to make sure to pair the information with things like visual aids and pictures or social stories. Um, some examples of visual aids that you could use when teaching menstruation would be um, to put red paint or food coloring in a pair of underwear to show what blood might look like. Um, 
getting the first period for a female with autism or for any female um, for that matter can be a very scary thing. Um, so it's important to provide a visual of what they might expect. Some other examples of visual aids you could use would be to mark um, in the underwear where a sanitary pad might go, for example, as well as to create a visual schedule of how often the pad should be changed or even um, a visual of, of the different steps of how to put on a pad, for example. Um, and you might also might want to include um, some modeling, so actually showing in person um, how to put a, a pad on a pair of underwear um, so that the, the learner has that active, um, active and visual representation. So again, this is just an example with the topic of menstruation, how you might integrate some of those different teaching tips that are helpful for learners with autism spectrum disorders. Another important topic um, that should be covered is the topic of privacy. Um, so included within privacy would be going over the difference between public and private. Um, again, you could use discrimination training to go over examples of what the difference between public and private would be. You also want to cover nudity. Um, so where is it okay um, to be naked across relevant environments? You also want to cover privacy regarding dressing. Um, you want to talk about um, knocking on doors, locking doors, um, private locations, personal space, um, family rules regarding privacy, and you want to cover how to teach, pri or you want to teach how to the individual can create privacy. So things like um, wearing a robe after they walk, you know after their shower when they walk from the shower to their bedroom, um, closing doors, um, closing shades in their bedroom when they're dressing, for example. So all of these are important to cover within the topic of privacy. Rules and laws are also very important to cover in terms of sexuality education for learners with autism. A lot of times um, laws can be confusing and it's important that these be taught in a way that the learner can understand. So again, you really want to cover the difference between public and private behavior and be as explicit and clear as possible um, and cover things such as what is okay, when it's okay, and where is it okay, especially things like masturbation and nudity because um, these are two behaviors that can get the individual in trouble. Um, so you want to be as clear as possible, provide multiple examples. Um, you also want to cover the topic of um, rules and laws regarding personal space and touch, so things like um, you know, how much personal space should you allow between other people? When is it okay to touch someone else? Where is it okay to touch them? Um, learners with autism spectrum disorders and their challenges with social behavior and understanding can pose a lot of risks um, for understanding different laws and things like that. Um, an example that I heard in one of Peter Gerhardt's presentations um, was something along the lines of a learner learning that um, nudity isn't okay in public. Um, and then he, this learner was at a pool and a female lifeguard, um, the bathing suit fell down and her breasts were exposed. Because he had, he had learned that nudity is against the law, um, he reached up on her bathing suit and pulled her bathing suit up for her in the meantime touching her in a way that she wasn't comfortable with but in his mind he was just sticking to the rules in a pretty black and white way of thinking. Um, so in that case or in that example um, if that woman was very uncomfortable there would be a legal risk or you know the risk that the law could become involved um, but it, 
it's an example of how a learner with autism spectrum disorder might misperceive certain laws and rules um, and take them very literally. Um, so it emphasizes the importance that we really have to be as clear as possible and provide multiple examples and provide thorough examples of um, things like what the rules and laws are. It's also important to cover um, rules and laws regarding the internet um, and safety on the internet. The internet is a huge area of risk <clears throat> both for safety of the learner as well as um, different rules about um, going on the internet and what's okay to be viewing on the internet. One of the, what I view as one of the most important topics um, in sexual health and sexuality education is the topic of personal safety and protection. Um, education in this area should really start early and continue throughout the individual's development. Um, so you really want to start teaching things like good touch and bad touch pretty early on. Um, <clears throat> you want to teach who can and can't touch, where it's okay to be touched, so specific parts of the body where it's okay to be touched. You want to rehearse and teach how the individual can ask for help. Um, and teach that secrets about touch aren't okay. You also want to teach self-advocacy advoc skills such as how to say no. Um, so not just teaching that it's okay to say no, but actually explicitly teaching how to say no. So role modeling how to say no and when to say no and providing very clear and um, clear examples of how to do this. It's also important for the learner um, to understand and learn how to report um, if something inappropriate, uncomfortable, or unsafe happens. And you can use different strategies such as modeling, guided practice, role plays, visuals, and social stories to teach a lot of um, these topics here. Within the topic of um, self-protection and safety, it's also important to cover safety regarding the internet and social media. Um, the internet is kind of a vast area of risk um, for learners with autism spectrum disorders and typically developing teens and adolescents. Um, the internet provides very easy access to harmful content as well as harmful people. Um, a lot of teens with autism spectrum disorders are very eager to make friends um, and places such as Facebook or other social media outlets um, do provide some risk for them to be approached by um, people that might be unsafe. So it's really important to cover safety skills regarding social media as well as internet. Um, there can be a lot of deviant content on the internet as well. Um, that is easily accessible to learners with autism spectrum disorders. Um, so it's important when you're educating on this topic to go over safety measures as well as to help teach parents safety measures. So things like um, safety settings and how to monitor internet use and things like that. Um, privacy is also important to cover when you're talking about safety and self-protection. Um, public restroom use is also important um, as well as for older, more advanced um, learners you want to talk about safe sex including contraception as well as um, education on sexually transmitted diseases. So again, all of these topics related, this is kind of an overview of what should be covered when you're talking about safety and self-protection in regards to sexuality. Um, just to touch on some practicalities when teaching some of these different definitions and laws and things like that, um, a lot of times our typical definitions have to be redefined um, for learners with autism spectrum disorders. So when we talk about the term private parts, a lot of times we define that as our body parts that are covered 
by our underwear or by bathing suits. Um, so when we're teaching good and bad touch, we might say um, bad touch would be um, when someone touches your private parts. If we're teaching just that, it can make rest, the rest of the body seem public. Um, so really it's not okay for a stranger um, to touch your arm or to touch your leg. So it's important to go over um, when we're teaching good and bad touch, not just private parts, but teaching, you know, a lot of touch by a stranger would be inappropriate. And examples and contexts that can help the, the in, individual learner understand when would be okay. Um, another example would be redefining the rule you have to ask before you touch someone else. Um, there's more to it than just this. An individual can't just go asking um, everyone in public if they can touch their arm or can I touch your leg or that could get them in trouble. So you want to make sure that you're redefining and defining these terms um, in a very clear and thorough way for the individual learner. Um, who's on the spectrum. Another important topic would be related to dating, sex, and relationships. Um, so some things that are important to cover with, within this area would be things like social skills, um, dating and relationship skills, for example, um, making a list of how to know when someone's interested versus when they're not interested in and providing very behavioral examples, so things like um, body language, examples of body language, examples of what the person might say if they're interested, um, and things like that. Within this topic, it's also important to cover intimate relationships, including sex, um, and, and providing specifics on what sex is, um, when it happens, where it happens, and how it happens. Um, safety regarding sex, as well as self-advocacy um, within relationships and within intimate relationships. Another important topic is the topic of masturbation. Um, this is one of the topics that does tend to trigger um, people's level of discomfort. However, masturbation, again, should be viewed as a natural part of human behavior. Um, remember back to some of the early slides when we talked about viewing sexuality as what makes us human and as a behavior. Um, physical exploration often begins really early. And individuals with autism, they might learn how to masturbate on their own and they might not. Um, but it's important to provide education on what it is. So I wanted to provide a few tips on, because um, there is a risk of problems with masturbation in learners with autism spectrum disorders if they have trouble understanding um, private versus public or if they're exhibiting things like masturbation in public or excessive masturbation. So here's some tips um, regarding that. In terms of preventing problems, it's really important to teach where is appropriate to masturbate. Um, the best place to teach is the individual's bedroom. Um, the bathroom isn't the most appropriate place to teach because there can be such variability in different types of bathrooms. So if you're teaching the bathroom, they might think it's okay to use a bathroom at school, to use a public bathroom. Um, but really the individual's bedroom is the best private place to teach for masturbation. Um, it's also really important to teach when it's appropriate. Um, so designating private time, um, teaching the individual to take privacy steps when they are going to masturbate. So things like closing the door, shutting the blinds. Um, and if you are dealing with problems, some tips um, for dealing with any issues regarding masturbation um, would be one tip is to interrupt the behavior and redirect to a more appropriate behavior. For example, if the learner is masturbating in public or in an inappropriate setting, you can try to interrupt and redirect. So for example, you might redirect um, to an alternative behavior 
where the individual has to use their hands or engage in a physical activity um, that keeps their hands busy and kind of redirects them from the act. Um, you can also try response blocking. So um, for some individuals it might work if you're really having trouble to um, wear a certain pair of pants that are tighter or to wear a belt that kind of blocks the ability to um, you know, put the hands in the pants. Um, or you can redirect the individual to their bedroom where it would be more appropriate. Um, but again, you want to teach, you don't want to punish the behavior, but you want to teach appropriate, the appropriate place and the appropriate time. Um, it's important if you're dealing with problems to remind the individual of the rules if they can understand the rules of where and when are appropriate. It can be helpful to use social stories and visual aids. Um, for example, you might use a symbol on the individual's bedroom door to, to de designate their private time. So uh, a green sign might be their symbol of this is private time and a red sign might be a symbol of um, this isn't private time. Try when you can to create a schedule or routine. So designate a certain private time during the day. It's also helpful to reinforce alternative or appropriate behaviors when you're teaching those. And again, avoid punishing um, the behavior of masturbation um, because it is a, a human behavior and it is a behavior that um, most adolescents will engage in. So it's not good to punish it. You want to teach appropriate behavior. Um, I'm going to go through these next few slides a little more quickly because I see that we're starting to run out of time. Um, but another important topic is self-care and hygiene. So covering things like personal hygiene such as um, showering, deodorant, shaving, um, as well as menstrual care. It's also important to cover personal values, so things like right versus wrong, reality versus fantasy. Um, with the internet age, the reality versus fantasy um, can be very risky, so it's important to teach um, the difference between what a learner might be seeing on the internet compared to what's realistic. You want to cover things like self-advocacy, self-respect, and self-esteem, um, what healthy relationships are, what healthy intimate relationships are. You want to cover family, and cultural, and self-values, as well as personal responsibilities. So a few guidelines on when to teach these topics. Again, all of what we've talked about, um, these different topics have different levels of complexity um, and they should be taught at different age ranges. But again, you want to take into consideration the learner's cognitive and developmental level. So some topics that can be covered within the earlier years, including preschool to elementary, would be things like um, differences in gender, public versus private behavior, good touch versus bad touch, as well as basic body part understanding. Um, and then during elementary, an intro to puberty and menstruation, um, as the learner is approaching adolescence is also important. Because remember, you want those topics to be proactive and to occur um, before the changes happen. In middle school, um, some guidelines of what to cover when would be um, covering puberty and menstruation, masturbation, independent bathroom use, and hygiene. And then also in middle school or beyond, depending on the learner um, and how complex the topic is, you want to cover things like physical attraction, dating and relationships, values, laws, safe sex, and pregnancy. Um, again, these are just general guidelines and you want to target it towards um, the complexity of the topic and the individual learner. Um, so I wanted to highlight just a few resources as we wrap up um, and hopefully I'll have a minute or two for some questions. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, a great resource on this topic is Peter Gerhart from the McCartan School. Um, 
I watched one of his presentations as a continuing education presentation. Um, I also saw that you can obtain one of his presentation slides. Here's a link to it. Um, but he's an expert in this area and is a great resource on this area. Um, a curriculum that Peter Gerhardt recommends um, that is a good curriculum to use with learners with autism spectrum disorders is called Our Whole Lives. Um, it's a long, a long title here, um, but you can access the curriculum or information about the curriculum at this link here. Um, it's provided by the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Um, there's also helpful information um, provided by the National Guidelines Task Force. Um, that's more basic information on sexuality education. Both of these curriculums aren't made specifically for learners with autism spectrum disorders. So keep that in mind. Um, here's a list of some books that are helpful. I'll try to leave this up for a moment. And I want to just pause for a minute because I want to see if I can get to a few questions in these last few moments. Um, but thank you for your time and I hope that all of this information was helpful for you today. Um, and I'm just going to pause the screen here and look at questions and try to get to a few. Okay, I'm just reading through some of the questions here. Let's see if I can pick a few. I'm getting a lot of questions about resources, so I just want to put um, my resource slides up there again. I'll leave them up for a moment when I finish these questions for you. Let's see. I have a question here. Um, should masturbation be explained and experienced? Um, again, it, it is something that um, should be viewed as a human behavior. Um, and it, it really should be explained. However, I do understand that there can be some cultural and value differences in terms of how masturbation is viewed. Um, however, information about it should be provided because um, a lot of times, you know, children will um, experience self-exploration and, and figure out what masturbation is on their own. So it's always more important, or very important, to have the information available, um, you know, whenever possible. Um, so yes, in, in most cases when you can, it should be explained, and it is okay if it's experienced. It is um, scientifically viewed as a human behavior. <clears throat> 